be admission to the museum. Yeah. Yeah. Danica Robson. When did you, you put the wave on your neck? Oh my gosh, in 2001. No, I get to see it in pictures every now and then, which is exciting. Okay. <laughs> who is the executive producer of MANA. Um, after the film, we're going to have a panel discussion with the artists I just mentioned, as well as Andy and Eric. So please enjoy and welcome Andy. There's good waves today, and I'm super excited that people actually took time from that to come out. And there's also regatta today, and there's another contest. So thank you for coming to see the film. Um, the director and I have worked on a couple of different projects before we started this one, and my husband, who's one of the artists in the film, they came up with the concept because um, we are surfers, we are in the arts, I'm a museum curator and a director in California and Los Angeles, and this was really an important, passionate thing for us, not only that, but to, to um, share the birthplace of, of surfing and the Hawaiian culture and how that influenced the artists, the, these 10 artists that we took on this journey to the Big Island, to all of these sacred places, and how once they got back in their studios in Los Angeles, how it filtered back through their practice and their, and their art making. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. Um, this is a, a great passion of ours, and these guys were amazing to work with, and um, and we'd love to talk about it after the film. Thanks for coming. surfers and um, and most of them were already friends so there were there's a core group there and then um, initially when I did the film on Alex uh, he mentioned that he had a house in Kona and that he invited me to come out and just basically hang out and if I felt compelled to we could do a film my goal was to have the film done by my birthday on December 1st and, and I did and I even took a whole month off and not even working on the film, and here we are. And you know, I think one of the difficulties for I don't need this, do I? Could you guys? Yes, please. Yes. Oh yes. <coughs> one of the difficulties was we didn't want this to turn into a vacation footage. It did the the point of the film, especially coming from my background, I'm a curator and I work with contemporary artists, and my my specialty is Los Angeles, obviously, because that's where I work. Um, and the the influence that surfing has made in contemporary art over the last 50 years is really significant and, and certainly in Los Angeles. I'm, I'm not sure how much this material is going to cross over for Hawaii, but the spirit of surfing definitely does, and especially since this is the birthplace of surfing. But we were so concerned with get, how do we get these artists there? How do they have this experience? How do, they, how, how do, how do we translate what that experience is into their studio without it looking like 
oh, here's our vac well, here's what we did over summer vacation, and now I'm going to make this painting, and look, oh, there's the palm tree that you know I photographed, and now it's going to be in the work. So I, there was like this kind of fine line of trying to still portray Hawaii and all the in its beauty, and you know, and how that translates into the work into these artists who aren't from Hawaii. Well, there are a couple of them that Steve grew up here. Uh, ben Bruff grew up on the Big Island. Alex and myself spend a lot of time there because we have a home there as well. But um, and then for Eric, who's not a surfer at all, to kind of come in there and you know get go through their studio practice and then also see them interacting with the ocean and how do those things cross over? Because you don't want nobody wants to look at vacation footage. I mean, the whole idea is to see how is it, how is their process? How is it influenced by what happens in the water? And, how does that change the way they paint or the subject matter that they use without? And then there's the other problem of not taking the project seriously because people go, oh, it's surf art. And oh, it's palm trees, oh, it's surfboards. And that, that's definitely not the case. This, these were not pro surfers that were, you know, that turned to an, being an artist later. These are people who make a living in the art world, making art um, with creative, you know, cr creatively, uh, part of the creative economy, and then they happen to surf, and that is a passion that go that translates into the work. But. You guys have any questions? I do actually. So the experience for the artists on the Big Island when you came back into your studios, how did that translate? Um, I'm a little bit more sculptural and digital, so I was kind of trying to figure out like we're going to have this very visceral experience in Hawaii, which I'm vaguely familiar with from my childhood or like, and we're all surfers so we, we do have that connection to that but I wanted to find a way to translate that experience and it was kind of weird because before I went I selected Kealakekua Bay and I really immersed myself in the story of James Cook and the Makahiki Festival and how he actually died and kind of interpreted it my own way before I went to Hawaii but then being in Hawaii and experiencing that place was so much more powerful I was like the chicken skin kind of thinking about it right now, but you know, as surfers, we, we can kind of, kind of continually experience that um, that feeling of sharing and pono, the balance and that sort of thing. So um, that visceral connection to the Big Island became a big part of how it sort of translating as we start to show it more to audiences. And um, I think it's really powerful to sh not just for uh, translating that you know to our youth and things, but um, but really sharing with like the broader community that's interested in art and also has a connection to surfing. My studio is a little different. Uh, my studio is uh, the South Bay of Los Angeles, basically. So it's colder, there's more people, and um, it's not as clear. So that's, for me, that's the difference. I think for myself, uh, you know, I make paintings, I make abstract paintings, so you're not gonna see uh, a literal reference to waves or the ocean or, you know, as like a, maybe a Wyland painting would, would reference that. I hope not. <laughs> but um, what happens um, with myself as well as my wife is that uh, we are re-energized. We do a lot of um, paddling with the canoe clubs and also uh, stand-up paddling. So I get the nice vantage point of, of being above looking down and so a lot of the transparency in the water and the different uh, effects of how water um, uh, moves over over reef and the different color changes. So, you know, that might be something I bring back into the work on, on some level. You know, so many times, you know, a, a non-art maker or somebody who may go to a gallery or museum will see the work finished on the wall and they might fall in love with it or they might be totally, you know, repelled or, or who knows what, nauseated by it. Or, but there still is this missing component in that, how did that work become? How was it made? So I think part of the, one of the hooks of, of the film that we tried to um, kind of pursue was to get the public into the artist studio and to see what the artists are influenced by and to hear them talk and to see the surroundings. I know as an art maker, one of the things that I get excited about going to another artist studio is what do they got on the wall? Not necessarily the paintings, but what are the things that they tore out of the magazine, or what kind of music do they listen to, or how are the brushes arranged, you know, stuff like that. How do they think and not necessarily gravitate straight to the painting on the wall or the sculpture in the corner? But anyway, I think that was one of the hooks of the movie that we were trying to go after was getting the public into the 
the artist space. Process. Eric, did you, did you have Eric, any resistance from the artist allowing you the freedom and the access to them when really what they do is sort of godlike, and then you're coming in there as your own form of god, and they want to say, well, how do I control? Can I control you? What you do? Well, at this point, um, I had probably done over 200 films already on artists in their studios. In many ways, I've kind of changed the way artists, especially in Southern California, look at how things are being documented now because the paradigm has shifted with my work. Um, it, before it used to be, it was very, everything was very proprietary and private, where I, I had kind of steam, steamrolled my way in and start documenting. So now people are lining up to have me film them because they want, they want to be first on record. They, they're looking, people are looking at more of these films as, as documentary, documentary historical pieces that, you know, I did this first and this is, the, this is when I did it. So um, one of the things I wanted to talk about though with, with, with the artists <clears throat> and uh, in my own process as a filmmaker, when I was thinking about how is this film going to be made and what's it going to be like, you know, and I was I would fantasize about are we going to do like a very quiet, meditative Terrence Malick kind of film with these beautiful voiceovers with these artists and show really no art, or is, you know, what I what I didn't want to do was do a travel walk for Hawaii. I didn't want to do an ESPN surf style film. Um, I was even thinking maybe we could do like a Michael Mann film with hookers and cocaine and speedboats and yachts and helicopters. You know, I was thinking like that too. <laughs> and, then, and then we just, we just got all serious and started having our meetings and stuff. And then there were some of the artists who were like, we need to have storyboards. And I'm like, you know, we're just gonna go and do what we have to do. And so, because I knew the opportunity was there. And it was actually, um, during the middle of the second week is when I realized I need to go home, I need to film these guys in the studio. Because there was really no talk about that uh, at that point. I just thought we would probably get enough material in Hawaii to make some kind of interesting film. And to me it wasn't working because the art the guys were doing in the so-called Swart Lodge in the garage you know, it was fun and everything, but you know, I needed to sh I needed to show what these guys really do, and so that's when I decided, well, I need to go back and film all these guys. And I have a question for Andy, if she doesn't mind. Um, obviously, the absence of women artists, and women surfers, there. come on. New, New York going there because I'm a surfer come myself. On. It was not. Um, we had three women that uh, actually, basically, this wasn't like a group of guys that knew each other. It was um, a couple guys that knew each other over here, a couple, and I knew one person in that group, and then I knew that I surfed with somebody in this group, or I made art, you know, or worked, I, I carried a show that this artist was in. Ken and I had never met before. Steve and I had never met before, except for on Facebook. Um, we talked about art on Facebook, we talked about surfing on Facebook, and had never met. Um, I think probably half the guys in the film I didn't know. Um, I put a call out to people that I was familiar with and that their work was on a level that was serious and um, we had a meeting and we had quite a few people show up and they and I said you know bring people that you think that you think that I would show at the museum if you think that I would give them a show then we want to keep kind of the level of that work strong so we had three women um, that made the like final cut and they were part of the group and one for whatever reason family emergency had to drop out and the other one couldn't travel because she was teaching and the third one at the last minute said well I don't want to be the token woman and so a lot of people think that this was organized just based on like this brotherhood of men but it, it, it really wasn't and I think that there was a hard a lot of female surfers who our artists professionally don't want people to know that they surf. And I know that there are, um, I work with a, quite a few artists from New York that surf, and they don't want, they, they, say, they think that there's this you know, negative stigma towards 
art makers who serve and that that's going to be held against them and that their work isn't going to be considered as seriously as, as an artist who doesn't let you know that they actually serve. Um, and and it, so it was, it was difficult to get female artists interested in this um, and then obviously like the three, like I said, kind of dropped out over the course of three or four months. But um, I knew that was going to happen and I've gotten a lot of people ask me, you know, well where are the women? And I, I don't think I have to defend it. I'm glad that you asked though, because it would be nice to talk about it. But I think that film is, even though they're all guys, it's not really a gender, it doesn't really have to do with gender. And you can still appreciate like what happens when you sit on your surfboard at sunset and watch the reflection of the light over the water and you have that moment, whether you're a man or a woman, like it's still the same experience. I'm in a lot of um, organizations in Los Angeles that are um, women's women in the arts organizations, and a lot of them, you know, are, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, this is really bad for us, and you're a feminist, and you should be doing. You should have women in there. And I can't force people to participate. And the same thing with you know curating for exhibitions. You invite the artists, and you um, are enthusiastic about showing their work, but you can't make them participate. And Everyone has their own reason for not, and it just happened that 10 guys were the ones that participated. And do you have something to add on that? I was going to say most, most of the artists in the film are, are very feminine. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what may have been the aspect of adding a woman that we would expect that like family um, experience, I don't think we needed that the gender to add that. I think it was definitely there with the guys that were participating. And by the way, everyone that was there on the trip brought their families. All of our kids got along. It was um, it was really special, and it wasn't like a great vacation. It was like a really amazing life experience. I have to admit that I was a little bit prejudiced going into this. Um, process not just because I surf and I'm like oh surfing's cool and I love it but like I'm a curator and I I want to make sure that we choose the right things to tell a story I mean that's my job and it reflects on me as a curator if we're not telling the story effectively if I if the elements don't add up and they don't come together and kind of a cohesive idea so uh, and certainly in the context of contemporary art this has so much to do with what's being made. And Che Polago, by the way, who's, um, and he's like sixth generation uh, tattoo artist and was taught by his great grandfather who actually tapped. Um, they're Tahitian and he's lived, his family's been on the Big Island, I think three or four generations, but there, um, he was so inspirational as he was kind of our guide through the history of the Big Island and getting us around. Ken, Ken, your art was mostly film, photography uh, and film? Yes. My contribution to the movie was basically uh, the, the water photography video, but I mainly do stills. That's it. Thank you, thank you. Awesome. Well, I was born at Tripler Hospital. That's right. You were born here. <laughs>